J10 Homes, how are you? I'm really well. How are you, Serene? Good. Thank you for coming on my podcast. I'm so excited. Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah. So you have an incredible YouTube channel. It's like one of the best science communication channels I've ever seen. Up in Atom. Thank you so much. Yeah. You, if, if anyone is out there and they haven't seen Jade yet, you have to watch the Aristotle's wheel paradox that she has. That's my favorite so far. Uh, cause it just explains, it just explains how you can have, I mean, at some point you tell, you talk about how you can have, you can have infinite numbers, but you could still have some numbers that are not in that number. Yeah. You can have, um, an infinite amount of numbers, but then you can have a bigger amount of infinite numbers. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know it's really strange, but um, when you actually listen to the argument, it's kind of like there isn't any other possibility, you know? There are mathematicians, as I understand it, like theoretical mathematicians who study infinity, like that's their entire job. I yeah. don't, I, <laughs> I don't know how that works. Like set theory and stuff like that. The the guy actually who in, um came up with set theory, he spent like his name was Georg Georg Cantor, and he spent his whole life contemplating infinity, and he actually ended up going insane. And I'm just like, yeah, I don't blame him, right? Yeah. <laughs> was it the syphilis or was it the infinity? Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Back then it was. <laughs> you... My friend has this theory that Nietzsche had a, um, a lot of people said that Nietzsche had like a syphilis or something. But my friend has this theory that says that Nietzsche actually had a brain tumor because at some point his eye was popping out more and more as he got older. And he thinks he had like a, a tumor right behind here. And one of his pieces of evidence is that uh, Nietzsche went to a brothel one time with his friends and he just sat there playing piano the whole time. So some people think he was completely celibate his whole life. Um, mm. Yeah, Nietzsche is not very mathematical or scientific though. Um, yeah, maybe he just didn't like any of the girls that night. Yeah, he he really didn't like women very much. I think he, he loved women, but I also think he hated women. Uh, not really? like, okay. yeah, kind of a kind of an OG incel, I think, um, in a bit of a way, but he was pretty cool. Um, yeah. So today I want to ask you, I'm really just interested in your, I'm so interested in your YouTube channel. Like you grew this, you've been doing it for how long? Six years now. Six years. Mm -hmm. And you have, I don't know, 470,000 followers of people who want to watch educational science videos. Like, and it's pretty cool. I'm like a uh, shout out to my audience. Like they're really, really cool. And the comments are, are like so intelligent. I mean, you have yeah. some real some real uh, brainiacs on your channel as well yeah yeah i'm like uh, i'm glad that people answer each other's comments because i'm like then i don't have to answer them and yeah. i'm like yeah yeah you guys you guys just yeah sure <laughs> part of being a youtuber is building a community though yeah i mean there's this uh i've i've just been studying the algorithm like pretty uh pretty hard and on on instagram for instance like it actually, it's not actually as important that you get new followers and you reach out to new people. It's actually important, and I'm sure YouTube is the same, that you make your current audience stick on your channel and keep coming and being recurring. And so you've built this community where people are like coming to learn about science and answering each other's questions and probably making friends and stuff like that. And so uh, algorithmically, you've done a really good job. It's really nice. Um, I definitely could do a better job of it, but... Um... I think, I don't know, I really, every time I make a video, I really try and think like, what was, what does my audience want? Um, and whenever I'm like analyzing which videos has done, have done well, that people are obviously more interested in, um, I always try and keep that in mind. So I know a lot of creators often um, make sure that they do like their own passion projects and stuff that they really want. But I think because the point of the channel is like to educate people about stuff that they want to learn about. I'm like, well, I want to make videos that you guys are interested in, you know? Mm. Um, so hopefully that's why they keep coming back. Yeah. Um, I might just jump into it because this is a, a pertinent question. So you actually shouted out on your Patreon and you asked your patrons to ask you questions and I got to handpick them. And uh, one of your patrons asked you, um, where is it? He said, uh, yeah, so this is actually the question I want to ask you as well. So thanks, Gabe Roche. Uh, what experiences in your youth moved you to become a, a scientist and then a YouTuber? So a lot of people might find this interesting, but I actually was not into science at all when I was young. I was way more into like art and music. Um, yeah, more like more, definitely more artsy. 
Um, I, I actually originally wanted to be a primary school teacher and I even dropped out of like science went as soon as I could. I was just not into it. Um, and then when I was 21, um, I decided to go to, you uni- oh, so the primary school teaching didn't work out and, um, I decided to go to university and <laughs> it's pretty random, but my mum, I-, I didn't know what I wanted to study. And my mum's friend's daughter was studying marine biology. And so she was like, Jade, like Jessica is studying marine biology. Why don't you study that? And I just had no idea what I wanted to do. So I was just like, okay, fine. Like, uh, whatever. Um, so I just enrolled in a marine biology degree and it was good. Like I really liked it. It was interesting. Um, but then in first year we had physics, it was like physical aspects of nature. So it was kind of like the physics of biology. And I just really, really liked it. I just thought, I don't know. I felt like for the first time ever, I really appreciated physics for some reason. I just really liked the way of thinking. I liked how everything was very fundamental. It's kind of like you just you just learn what the equation means and then you can apply it to so many different things. Um, it was just very satisfying and like interesting. So I after a year of doing marine biology, I switched to a physics degree and then I just never gone back and it's just been amazing um and then in terms of like the communication and stuff I think because I had I hadn't done physics in high school and when I started the degree I was really behind the other students like I didn't know very very basic things um and I found I often found lectures like very overwhelming there was just all this information and I was just like I'm not getting anything and it was like at the beginning of the course as well so it's like at a time where you feel like you should at least like you you feel like the information is quite basic like you should be understanding it um so I had to do a lot of self-learning and basically the way I learned was from YouTube I just found it was the best way to learn like it was very visual I liked that you can pause and like go back multiple times you could just learn at your own pace the people the teachers on YouTube are just so good <laughs> for some reason <laughs> like they're just so good um yeah so that's how I kind of got introduced to the whole YouTube like I, I knew that YouTube was a very good source of education um, that wasn't around like while I was in high school. So I really appreciate it and thought it was like really new and just awesome. Um, and then, yeah, then when I got to the end of the degree, I didn't really, I hadn't thought about what I wanted, like a job or anything until the very end of the degree. And there was just like no job in physics that really appealed to me. And I guess I'd like had a lot of exposure to YouTube videos. Um, so I kind of thought I knew what like made a pretty good YouTube video also, I'd done some tutoring in um, in university as a job, so I just thought, uh, like, yeah, I could maybe be a, a physics YouTuber. So, <laughs> like, I'd seen people do it, like Veritasium and Physics Girl. Like, I knew it was a job, um, so I just gave it a go, and it worked. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, it was, I feel so lucky. Like, uh, I was so unsure. Like, it's a very uncertain thing. You know, it's like a lot of people try – before they see any kind of success to talk you out of it um like you know parents and stuff because it is quite risky but then yeah it really paid off so I'm very grateful for that yeah I've noticed um I have I have a very small channel right now 370 something followers but as I grow my friends watch more like oh that's interesting yeah I mean it just it's it's it just seems like it's no longer sort of a a fun hobby that your friend is doing it's like oh there's actually some success here and so people I think are just drawn naturally to to success or status or whatever it is I think so too it's like they have evidence now that like what you're doing is good Mm. so they think that it's better Mm. yeah no I definitely get that I'm uh I'm not surprised that you said you you studied you were really in arts and stuff like that because yeah no um because I think if you're pure science it's the communication aspect, like that whole communication empathy aspect isn't really part of it. Whereas because you've learned to break things down so well and use all these visual aids and like, I mean, your channel has great art, like, and it has great art, but it's actually, yeah, yeah, (laughs) for sure. But I mean, in your directorial style as well, but of course the animators, but like, and it's so clean that I don't even notice there's art unless I'm actually like watching the editing techniques and stuff. It's just, kind of is in front of me you know and um 
So it, it seems like you need an artistic mind to convey ideas like in the way you do. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think because like I'm not naturally physics minded, I feel like, as I mentioned, I'm like more artsy and stuff like that. So physics concepts definitely don't come very naturally to me. I had, I have to work pretty hard to like understand a concept, but I definitely think that that helps a lot with my communication skills. Cause I feel like most of the things that people who aren't naturally that um, gifted with physics or math are having trouble with, like I'm also having trouble with, and I can recognize where where they are like um even when I was in uni you know like I felt like a lot of the lecturers would just skip a lot of steps that really weren't obvious to me anyway um so I guess also like also the fact that that happened a lot during uni and I know that it feels horrible like it feels horrible to feel like you're not understanding a really simple concept, even though it's like, it's actually not simple, but the lecturers or whoever the teacher, they usually make it seem like it's very simple to them. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not a very nice feeling, like feeling very stupid. Mm -hmm. And I felt like stupid a lot during my physics degree. So I think that's also another reason like why I wanted to do the channel because I'm just like, you're not stupid. It's just that if the information hasn't been presented in a way that maybe you can understand, like especially everybody learns differently, like visual learners and audio, like audio learners. Um, yeah, so I just feel like it definitely could be more complete than YouTube, but YouTube is more complete than like a lecture hall mm -hmm. or a textbook, for example. Like textbooks are just, I find them really hard to just read, you know. This is undertone here of um, the fact that, you felt stupid in your physics degree and didn't understand things going in and then you completed a physics degree like you actually i'm i wonder how what how consistent your work ethic is because it sounds like to me you just grinded it out like you just kept showing up and, and studying i really did and i think part of the reason is because in high school i i was a pretty lax student like i didn't really care that much um I was more interested in just like parties and just whatever. So I think when I went to uni, I was a bit more mature, like I was 21. Um, and I was just like, no, I'm going to do well. Like I actually want to do really well now and see see my own potential, you know. Um, and also the physics degree was just really interesting. Like I think like if, I, if I'd done uh, something I'd found boring but also hard, like I just wouldn't have done it. I'd just be like, this is stupid. Um, but because... I, w I had this kind of like, okay, like I want to see what I can actually do. And also because the physics concepts were just so interesting that I was like, okay, I actually want to understand this. And if I have to work hard to understand it, I'll just work hard, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. So I, I'm pretty proud of myself that I did finish the degree and it was like a huge kind of confidence boost as well. Like I remember thinking like at the end of the degree, like, I don't know if, um, like, definitely it did teach me a lot of physics, but it wasn't, like, the main thing. I wasn't kind of like, oh, after three years of this degree, I, like, know way more about physics. It was kind of just, like, I'm way more confident in myself and my ability to, like, overcome obstacles and stuff because, like, mm. it was quite challenging. Did you start the channel right after you finished your degree? Pretty much, yeah. Just, mm. like, uh, I did a very short internship um, in computational physics that I really didn't like. Yeah. Um, that was only about three months. And then I and then I started the channel basically straight away. So that was mm. 2016. Yeah, that I started. And then how did you handle those first couple of years of just... I mean, I, I imagine that you... It was just like starting any other YouTube channel where it's, it's quite difficult for the first few years of, of getting noticed and getting recognized and slowly building up a following. It was really, really hard, especially because I had no um, experience in video editing or video recording or anything like that. Like I was, if you see my first few videos, they're just off a smartphone and there's terrible audio. I didn't even have a microphone. Um, but I was super, super lucky in that just after I finished my degree, um, my husband, who was my boyfriend at the time, got offered a job at Carnegie Mellon in the US. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's um, in Pittsburgh. Yep. So we moved together to the US and his contract was for two years. And because it was the US, I couldn't work because you need like a working visa. Yeah. So you just, so I was just like, okay, I'm going to spend these two years just like trying to build up the channel. So I was like super lucky in that for two years, like I had 
financial support and I was literally working on the channel like eight nine hours a day like sometimes even like 12 hours a day because I was like super super obsessed um but I did have the luxury of time and not having to like do a full-time job to support myself and then in the night do the channel or whatever yeah and I just I guess I want to say that because it is it is really hard doing a channel and I don't want people to look like people that might have been starting a channel now or have maybe tried to start a channel and found it really hard to like think that it's something that's about them um like maybe to look at me and be like oh like you know some people make it like why didn't I make it it's kind of like well I did have this very very fortunate opportunity where I could dedicate all my time and energy to it for literally two years straight without having to um worry about finances or anything like that Mm. and you also um obviously it's a very privileged position and I'm in a similar privileged position but you also did spend 12 hours a day (laughs) like I don't want to take that away from you either because you know I I, it's if you don't have a job it's hard to organize your time and like I find it difficult to like stay on task for a couple hours not not to mention 12 and like everyone I know when they when they take some time off their job it's just like oh I a lot of times it's like oh I did nothing for six weeks like (laughs) so props to you are you do you consider yourself a naturally organized person Oh, it's not really, definitely not organized. Mm. Um, But I do think that if I want something, I'll like work pretty hard for it. Like I I think that I'm um, uh, unreasonably optimistic. (laughs) So kind of like, you know, when people, I think a lot of people, they wouldn't start a YouTube channel because it's like quite risky and uh, a very small percentage of people make it and stuff. But like, I don't know, for me, that never bothered me. I was always kind of like, yeah, but some people make it. So like, if some people make it, some people make it, you know, like, why not just try and why not just try and make it? Um, Mm. Yeah. And it's uh, not quite like a lottery either, right? It's not like one in 500 people randomly selected make it. It's like, there's a series of things that you do and those things get you more views and get you more clicks and all that stuff I yeah I agree I I do like I'm still learning all that stuff like I still have I feel like I have a lot to improve in um you know just being more successful and getting more views and always I like always figuring out what people want I feel like uh Still, when I upload a video, I'm not sure if it's going to do well. And I'm surprised sometimes the ones that do really well. And I'm just like, oh, I like you people. <laughs> like, I love you guys, but you also frustrate me. But it's actually like, it's nice because it keeps me on my toes. Mm. Like, I feel like sometimes if, I, if I'm getting a bit burnt out or maybe if I just had a video that did really well, I can become a bit complacent. And I'm just like, oh, I'll just do a paradox or I'll just, uh, I feel like I figured out what, what they want. Or maybe I'll just take this video easy. It always, always backfires. <laughs> like, no, I cannot. I cannot let up for like a single second. My audience just will not handle it. And then, like afterwards, I'm just like, it's like annoying, but also I'm like proud of you guys for having like such high standards. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, it really pushes me, and it's kind of like you know, like this love hate relationship. They want quality. <laughs> they demand quality from you. They do. It's and it's good. Like quality is what you should be mm. wanting and aiming for. So. Yeah, yeah. Keeps me sharp, which is also like, um, you know, if you don't want to, if you're not challenged in a job, you'll get bored of it. And I feel like, yeah, YouTube is just a constant challenge. So I think that's why, like, even after six years, like, I'm I'm not even close to being sick of it or anything. Wow. That's amazing. It's very impressive. Um, I want to ask you a question from the audience from Michael Sadell. And he says, how do you organize your notes? Um, so I don't super organize them. I kind of just... Uh, when I'm learning something, I just summarize stuff and like write it down in literally in a notebook. Um, and yeah, that's kind of it. Um, some, I have like a a notebook per topic usually Mm. if I'm, and I try to limit learning a a maximum two topics at once, but sometimes I get a bit excited and I'll just start randomly learning another topic or something, but then, you know, but then I feel like I'm, I forget, like, it's just not very effective. I actually didn't write this one down, but he said afterwards that he switched from Obsidian to, uh, from Google Docs to Obsidian, and he said it was, like, life-changing for him. So is that my- Michael? Yeah, that's uh, that's Michael Sato. Yeah, I only wrote down half of his question, because the rest, yeah. 
But okay, Michael, you're gonna have to tell me about Obsidian because like I've heard of it, but I literally use Google Docs as well um, to sort of just like you know I have a like to do list and I just use Google Docs. Um, so you're gonna have to tell me about that. <laughs> yep. Off to you, Michael. I I uh, I think I also need to. It's um mm. I've been looking into Anki decks actually recently. Um, I had a a guy tell me that Anki, he reads like textbooks all the time and he's just got a system down for reading textbooks. And he says, he'll, he'll do a chapter and find the, I don't know, oftentimes the, the questions at the end of the chapter. And then yeah. he'll just write Anki decks for each and every question. And then he'll, as he's reading through, he'll uh, just use those all the time. So like flashcards. Uh, so Anki decks is like flashcards? Yeah, Anki decks are flashcards, yeah. Um, okay, that could so be go- something to look into as well. Yeah, it's a flashcard app. Um, and you... I think the best part about it is that you can download other people's flashcards as well. Mm. So they've, I have, a, I have a friend who told me he was, he was going to learn German. And so he downloaded the Enki deck flashcard and it was, uh, it was like this, this incredibly well-organized, um, just flashcard deck from, from easiest to hardest. And then he, and then he tried the Italian one and it was like this haphazard, <laughs> which is, I don't know. That is so funny. Yeah. Very, very Italian. Um, <laughs> very Italian and very German. Yeah, and very German. Yeah, exactly. They, they, the, the stereotypes fit. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, that is to say that I think you get varying qualities, but I, I think there's, you know, obviously you can just find the most popular one and it's pretty good. So if anybody has any good notes recommendations, write them down in the comments. Yeah, thank you. I would love that. Thanks. Yes. Um, because sometimes I feel like these notes, like my husband, for example, he had one for a while called Miller Note. Um, sometimes I feel like they just complicate things. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you know what I mean? Like you spend half your time organizing your notes rather than like doing the work. And I just would never want that to happen. And I feel like the Google Docs thing, it's just very simple. And like, I don't seem to have a problem or lose track of things. But then again, I've never really explored like how much better it can be. Mm. I'm not, I'm not super, I wouldn't consider myself super organized to put myself in, a, uh, putting myself in a box like that. But I, uh, in the past, I've just never been that good at organization or like keeping notes or anything. So I, I enjoyed programming for the reason that the entire, the entire career of programming is just Google. Like you're only Googling stuff. And then you kind of, you never really have to take notes, um, or study. I mean, some people do, some people just read an entire book, but I just, I found that it was really nice. I like to have a job where I can just Google everything and I don't have to like memorize a bunch of stuff by rote. Yeah, definitely. Just like learning on the go. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll ask another question. Um, Vincent Zalzal uh, asks, what is your most memorable aha moment when learning about science? Uh, So I'm going to say probably more math than science, but when I finally understood what calculus was all about, so, so I think I was a very typical math student in high school in that you just learn the rules of calculus. Like you just learn, oh, that's the product rule, that's the chain rule or whatever. You don't actually know what you're doing. So you can get like 100 out of 100 on a test or whatever. Um, but then if someone asked you like, what is calculus, you wouldn't know how to answer. Mm-hmm. I feel like for me, and definitely when I was at school, that was most people. Um and then when I decided to do my calculus video and actually like be like, okay, like what is calculus? It seems to come up a lot. People talk about like how amazing it is, how it's like the, one of the best in- inventions slash discoveries of mathematics. Um, surely it's just more than just learning a few rules. Like, you know, it's, it, it has so many applications. Um, so when I really learned about how it's kind of just a mathematical tool that deals with uh like change and just finding um things out about a curve when usually you can only find things out about straight lines Mm. i was just like wow like that's really simple you know Mm. like (laughs) they make it sound so complicated in school and then when you really learn what it's about like you know if you truly understand the limit and um like what a derivative is it's like actually very simple Mm. and i think that was like a big aha moment for me being just like wow, like calculus, everybody thinks it sounds really hard and daunting. At least I did. But then like, it's, it's just not. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was definitely a big aha moment for me and a very satisfying one. 
if, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, watch my video on three, pa uh, three paradoxes that gave us calculus and you'll know what I mean. Cool. Ah, good. Um, and he also asks, I'll, I'll go to the next one. He asks, if you could interview any scientist that are alive, who would it be? I would choose a live personally, but... Um, oh, you would choose a live? Why? I, dead ones probably don't give good conversation. <laughs> nice. Um, well, you know, I think that dead scientists just have so much more, like, awe about them. Mm. Like most dead people, I guess. It's just they're like legends, basically. So I'm going to have to lean toward dead ones. Also because I do like to cover a lot of historical math in my videos, so there are I, I kind of know a lot about a lot of dead uh, mathematicians, mm -hmm. uh, mathematicians and scientists. And so I don't know if I could actually get him to talk. I think that I would really like to interview Kurt Gödel, who's responsible for Gödel's incompleteness theorem, mm. um, which basically was a proof that uh, within any mathematical system, um, there are things that you can, uh, there are things that are true within the mathematical system that you can't prove within the mathematical system, but they're true. And you know that they're true. They're just impossible to prove within the system. And that's like a pretty crazy thing. Like it's very like, yeah, I understand your face. It's very <laughs> like um, self-referential and just very outside the box thinking. But also he was just uh, so notoriously difficult to get an interview with, mm -hmm. um, not just an interview, but even meeting with other mathematicians. Like um, I think I think it was Gregory Chaitin, who is a famous mathematician that's still alive, but he um, had an idea about his own incompleteness theorem and he called Kurt Gödel and like wanted to have a meeting with him and Gödel actually said yes and first of all that's very very impressive if Gödel meets you uh, agrees to meet you but then on the day of it was it like was snowing or something and Gödel was like oh it's snowing I'm not coming into the uh, <laughs> into the university today so we can't do our meeting and so they just never had the meeting oh. um and also yeah he was just like notoriously shy and he actually he actually um died because he was he was worried that uh people were trying he would only eat his wife's food because he was worried that people were trying to poison him and i can't remember why but for i i can't remember why she couldn't cook for him for a while but basically he starved to death what <laughs> it's like it's like so ironic right it's like you're worried that people are trying to poison you so you just starve to death it's like you're afraid of death but then you just Anyway, I'm so, yeah. I mean, you have to have a, a caliber of, of, of rigidity to actually, like, it's so surprising to me when, when you can thwart evolution, like ev yeah. every, every part of your body is like, you need to eat right now. And he's like, no, no not until it, and he can't cook his own food for some reason. He's I never learned to not. cook an egg. He never cooked his own food. Yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. He just seemed like a very interesting character. So something I found really interesting about Gödel's philosophy was that his incompleteness theorem kind of um, not debunks but puts into question something called formalism, which is uh, created by this well, brought up by this guy named uh, David Hilbert, and it's basically that mathematics is just rules and a game. It doesn't. It, it just happens to sometimes reflect reality, but it's not like drawn from reality. Um, and Gödel was like secretly a Platonist. So basically he thought that mathematics kind of like was based on an ideal form and that it wasn't just a game. Um, and so I think it's really funny that his, his theorem kind of like debunks uh, formalism and it's like really in line with his own philosophy. And I'm like, I don't know if that was on purpose, but I just think it could have been like a fun motivator for him. He's like, because Hilbert's um, formalism was like taking over the mathematical world. Oh. And I just think it would be cool if her, if uh, Gödel's just like, no, and then just comes up with this super, like mathematical proof to like prove that. <laughs> there has to be some energy behind that too. Like I, right. I imagine he was just pissed off at, at <laughs> Hilbert and the play. Hil Hilbert, was that his name? Hilbert, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Hilbert and the Platonic theory. Platonism, I believe, is uh, just to explain, is like Plato had this idea that they were, there was a, maybe a realm of the gods were like because a circle in, in real life or a sphere in real life is never really a perfect sphere right there's always little imperfections and then in this ideal platonic form there there are these godlike perfect spheres and 
perfect triangles and stuff like that. And so I, I think Hilbert, does that mean that Hilbert, like, do you think he believed in this like heavenly place where, where these things actually had a, a platonic form? Is that? Anna, Anna, Hilbert or Gödel? Hilbert, right? He had the... I don't think Hilbert did because Hilbert was very practical. Um, he was kind of like, what can and what can't we do with mathematics and who really cares about what it represents and stuff. Um, so I don't think he would have agreed in, uh, would have believed in the Platonic world. Mm -hmm. Also because he lived much later than Plato. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the ancient Greeks, they're all very mystical and spiritual and stuff like that. Whereas mm -hmm. in Hilbert's time, they were more just like practical and yeah. Mm. It reminds me like of, of, um, what you said about, uh, Gödel reminds me of someone like Martin Luther, where he was just this angry priest who was drinking all the time and had anger issues and he was like pissed off at the catholic church and so he nails the 98 whatever they are on the on the wall of the catholic church and like there's just this you know we we see the outcome that people make in in life we see what these mathematical formulas that they make and, and like the products but we don't oftentimes the character is this person who's like very strange <laughs> maybe has like you know, afraid to go outside. Like, I think Kafka is, like, really anorexic and super skinny and, like, frail and just, you know, scared of life. But he wrote, you know, they have these massive intellectual, massive egoic forms and and, and it kind of drives their, their brilliance. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're usually very esoteric, especially the theoretical ones. Because I feel like they don't really live in the real world. Like, their imagination is just so vivid. That it's kind of like, yeah, I don't know. They, yeah, I can understand, like, well, I can't understand, but I can imagine why they're so weird and crazy. You know, it's like, it's like for Plato, probably the Platonic world was more real to him than the than the world we live in. You know, mm -hmm. and then that would just totally change your perception of things and make you a bit like very not down to earth. But I, I don't know. I, I really admire that. I think I think that it's cool that they managed to transcend above like the social games. Well, a lot of them anyway. Like the social games we play, and and like you know, even in a lot of times, like they could have been uh, like had higher status or more money or something. But they just were so obsessed with their art and their ideas that nothing else really mattered to them. And I just I really think that's cool. Yeah. To answer that question myself, I would choose Carl Jung, and um, wow. if he can be considered a scientist, I don't know. He's his his methods are so. pretty unscientific. Psychology is science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he was the father of. He was one of the fathers of modern psychology, which is. Uh, I don't know if psychology is currently uh, understood as a science by many people, but. Uh, I really thought it was. No, I'm kind of just joking because they have this, they have, a real replication crisis, and they're yeah, sometimes you read psychology papers and it's like. These people have either never learned math or they're <laughs> kind of kind of doing their own thing with math that isn't necessarily subscribed to by most mathematicians. But um, anyway, uh, to transition into that, Rick DeWitt said, um, he asked the question, where is your shadow? And I, I just want to give a brief uh, interpretation of what I believe the shadow is. And the thing about Carl Jung is that a lot of people tell you what Carl Jung said, and most of them are wrong because he was a genius and he had these massive amounts of, of books that were incredibly dense and difficult to read. He wasn't a, uh, he wasn't a very like, he wasn't a very Jade like writer. He wasn't good at conveying high level ideas to the, to the audience. And so, you know, don't trust anyone who says they know what Carl Jung was thinking, I, I think. But, um, but I will say that the shadow uh, is this idea that you have a repressed unconscious <clears throat> side of yourself. And so like a golden shadow, uh, the, is, is something where like if you're if you're writing when you're a kid or you're drawing when you're a kid and your mother says don't stop drawing it's not gonna make you're not gonna make a career out of it drawing stupid and you stop drawing but you kind of harbor this like interest in drawing your whole life and this energy pointing towards drawing and then as you get older you see this artist who kind of represents some part of you who does something that maybe you would have wanted to do and, and you hate them for no reason and maybe you tell yourself it's because you know they they, you think they're stupid or whatever but in reality you have this oppressed part of yourself that really wanted to go out and draw and and shadow is often referred to as something negative and so like um 
politicians who are really arrogant and lie a lot of times. Some people like take a politician and project a bunch of stuff onto them and talk about how evil they are. But some people think that uh, there's, you know, if the politician lies a lot and you're really mad at that, maybe one possibility is that maybe you're lying and you know you're lying and you're angry at yourself for lying. And maybe they're really arrogant and maybe you're really upset that you don't have the confidence to like go and ask that girl out or whatever it is, you know? And, and so, yeah, there's a lot of reasons it could be that doesn't, but um, yeah, that's a shadow. So uh, Rick DeWitt says, where is your shadow? And I, I'm wondering if you have any sort of answer to that. I definitely do. So um, my shadow, I think is, or like what I'm very envious about with people and maybe do get a bit upset with them is very, very like confident and like bold people with like very strong personalities who aren't afraid to just kind of like say their opinion. Um, so I guess an example, like a good example that you guys probably know is like Simone Gertz. Do you know her? No. She's got a, she has her own YouTube channel and she's great. She's very, very big. Um, and she has a very strong personality and like, she's always like swearing, like she just doesn't seem to care what anyone thinks. And like, I'm just so not like that. Like, I think especially like I'm, I'm better now, but still not that good. But especially when I started the channel, I was like so scared of like what people would think and like, and like so scared of like what to say. Even now when I'm writing scripts, I'm like every single sentence is like, oh, like, is that sentence okay? And um, am I putting too much personality? Should I put more or less personality? Like I'm literally constantly questioning everything. Mm -hmm. um, on the channel but also just in life um yeah and I think just like having the freedom to just not think so much <laughs> to just be like just have something come to your mind and then you just say it you know and you mm. don't really care about who, who thinks about that and it, like what's ironic is that people like that are actually more magnetic you know because like people are attracted to confidence and even if they maybe they say something that you don't agree with or that you don't like you still kind of like respect them or something or other people will maybe be persuaded to think in a way that they think they're just um just bigger personalities you know and I always feel like sometimes I'll get annoyed with people who like not that I get annoyed at Simone Gertz but just like people that come like I've come across in my life like I'll get annoyed with people who don't think before they say and maybe say stupid stuff or um just don't seem like once somebody described me as um having like the reins on a horse and like constantly pulling back the reins. And I'm like, yeah, I feel like I do. Like as soon as I get some kind of momentum or idea, I'm always like question it. Like literally whenever I have an idea for a video or the channel, I'm just like, oh, but is that the right thing? Like maybe I could do something else. Like, do you know what I mean? Mm. And I'm literally about that with every, every single thought basically. Um, and then after a while, it just comes across as I feel like quite insecure quite like you don't have your own personality um safe like it's too safe like do you know what I mean mm. yeah <laughs> that's my shadow I'd say <laughs> yeah that was quite the opposite of safe though I mean that was very oh. immediately very raw <laughs> yeah but at the same time I don't feel like I said anything controversial mm -hmm. like I I don't mind being vulnerable like that's fine but I don't think I like I don't know also, this yeah. is like more chill, you know, this mm -hmm. is like, for, I think another really good example is Vsauce, like he's amazing and he breaks all the rules and I feel like the way he writes his scripts, um, you cannot be playing it safe, like I feel like his scripts are very much just flow of consciousness, like the way he thinks, because there's no way, I don't know, <laughs> he's just like, it's just so interesting and like, what, what's happening with your mind kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think like uh, mental freedom is something that like I really admire. Hmm. Wow. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> um, there was uh, one time we, we know each other a bit outside of this. And uh, one time you told me that you have you took a directorial course in how to make YouTube videos. And go on. Oh, not, not specifically YouTube videos. So um, when I was about maybe like two, one or two years into the course, uh, sorry, into making YouTube videos, I think I, um, production quality was never like a huge uh, 
thing for me. I was more focused on like writing really good scripts and understanding the concepts really well. Um, but then I think I saw a video by Vsauce 3, um, Jake, I think his name is. Yeah, Jake. And his video was just so beautiful. And like he, he cares a lot about cinematography and stuff. I actually think he has a cinematography background and then transitioned to educational YouTube. Um, and yeah, that inspired me to be like, wow, like I want to make beautiful videos, you know? Um, so I went to an eight week film course in New York, which was like super, super exciting. It was like such a fun time um, just to learn like, you know, some cinematic techniques and how to level up my YouTube videos. Um, yeah, I, I still don't place too much emphasis on production quality because I really do like the roughness of YouTube. Um, but yeah, it definitely did help and build my confidence in some things. Like now when I film outside or film a certain shot, I'll be like, oh, I know, I, I'll know how to edit that or I'll know how to like what angles to choose and stuff like that. Mm. There's this guy like Alex Formosi, he does uh, YouTube videos on being rich, I guess. He, he talks all about how to, how to get rich and how to like level yourself up essentially. And they're great. And he, he says that the best thing to do, one of the best things you can do is just invest a lot of money in your education. Like uh, you can spend three years learning how to, reading books on cinematography and learning about it yourself and investing your own time. But instead you could just go do a two week course in New York and learn how to be a director. And I mean, I've watched some of your earlier videos and your later videos, and there's an astounding difference in quality. Like they're, they're, they take on a story form now that was okay. just not present before that I really enjoy. Mm -hmm. it seems like it was a great investment for you I mean it's just you're just doing one of the things that is typically hallmarked as like a trait of a successful person which makes sense um I actually don't think that the film course taught me much about story or like the way mm -hmm. that I structure I actually think like so for one another inspiration inspiration yeah inspiration of mine is um Veritasium and he does these he's recent like Kind of recently started doing these stories um and i really liked them so i thought about like oh maybe maybe i should try doing a story um also i recently got this set of like it's, it's actually funny they're cards they're called pip deck cards and they're actually meant for people giving presentations like in the workplace um and they they outline like you know the five major stories that like capture people's attention or something like that and i've kind of been following following that as well for a few of them like um for my one plus one equals two video it follows a story arc of uh, i think it's man in a hole where it's like um there was some everything was fine and then there was like a problem and then there were these heroes that had to come and like save the day and you actually end up in a better place and so I followed that story arc, um, which is the one that Kurt, G Kurt Vonnegut says, yeah. like, he said about it, no one loses money with the man in the hole story. Yep, yep. Story arc. Um, and for my Zero video, the Why Zero was banned for 1500 years, I used a story arc called From Rags to Riches. So basically it was like Zero, like, didn't exist or, like, wasn't a thing and it was, like, down in the dumps or whatever. And then... Uh, through a series of events and by it's also because it's so it's so, has potential within itself um it it rose to triumph in the end wow yeah <laughs> there's so much detail in your videos how long does it take you to make a video on average uh about two or three months hmm. yeah. do you do multiples at the same time or do you just usually concentrate on one uh, sometimes it changes. I generally concentrate on one. Um, I also have some, like a couple of script writers, so they'll mm. be working on a video like in the background. Um, yeah, but usually I, I tried, I used to try and do like multiple videos at a time and I just found, uh, this didn't really work. I just felt like I was wasting a lot of time. Mm. Um, so now I try and just do one at a time. Yeah. But sometimes it does get frustrating because you get really sick of a topic and, you know, if you've been researching something for like a month and you're like, oh, like I'm still not really close to being where I want and like nowhere near close to writing a script or whatever, it's mm -hmm. pretty tempting to just start working on something else. Um, but that's just something I have to deal with. Mm. I might ask one more q and I think there's only one more left. Um... 
Is it hard to find? So Piotr Klos, sorry if I'm butchering your name. He uh, he asked a few questions, but actually many of them have already been answered in this interview. So um, I'll ask the one that I don't think has. It's is it hard to find a topic that can be presented to a broad audience and still isn't very well covered by others? It is very hard. So I. For me, it's not hard to find a topic that I think would make an awesome video, like there's lots of topics, but especially in physics, so many topics have already been covered. It's like all the low hanging fruit have been covered, like all the cool and pretty easy things have been covered. So I feel like a lot of what's left is the really cool and hard stuff. But then PBS FaceTime basically does that. Um, Sabine Hossenfelder also is really good with that kind of stuff. Um, I feel like they can do that um, like much more quickly than I can. Mm-hmm. Um, so it doesn't really make, like they release a video like every week. Um, so it doesn't really make sense for me to be doing those kinds of videos because it would just take me so long to learn. Um, yeah, and actually that's why I've started introducing more computer science topics into uh, my channel because physics I feel like is quite saturated. Um, math math still got still has a lot of really cool topics, but I think physics is very like mis- like cool and mysterious. Like there's something about physics, like talking about time and space and gravity and stuff. You know, it's just uh, math doesn't have that same allure. Like you need to sometimes be a bit um, esoteric or even kind of understand quite a lot of math to even know the significance of something that's very mathematical. Mm-hmm. Um, And so, yeah, that's why I'm trying to introduce more computer science videos, because I feel like it's kind of untapped. Like there aren't that many computer science uh, channels um, and there are a lot of cool concepts in computer science that still haven't been explored. But again, they they can be a bit esoteric and you do need to know, like, first of all, you've got to be interested in computers and computer science. Whereas I feel like with physics, like you don't have to be that interested to be in, to know about why a ball bounces a bit weird off a surface or something like that, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's very visual. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, it's pretty hard. And also because the topic, I think, is the most important thing in the entire video process. Like if you have an amazing script and amazing production and the topic's not interesting, it's not, the video is not going to do well. Like the topic is the most interesting thing. So I do spend a lot of time choosing the topics um but yeah to answer your question it's pretty hard wow and sometimes a topic can be very interesting but then but but also because the title and the thumbnail of the video is so so important it's like literally half it's the first thing people see and if that's not good people won't watch your video Mm -hmm. um Sometimes I, I can be like, oh, this topic is really, really interesting, but then I can't think of a way to make a title and thumbnail interesting for it that people will click on, you know? Whoa. So that's like kind of another challenge, yeah. Wow. Do you ever just not make a video because you can't figure out the right title and thumbnail? Uh, def- like, yeah, I, I try and think of the title and thumbnail like before I go into mm-hmm. making a video. Yeah. Um, that's like what was advised to me by some people in the agency that I work with. Mm. Yeah, makes sense. Um, do you think any collaborations are in the future with other science YouTubers? Yes, but I don't want to say because I don't want to. I don't want to jinx it, and I don't want them like if they see it to be like I'm being presumptuous. Like, do you know um, what I mean? Yeah. Like nothing is planned, but I definitely have like ideas. I want to hear in the comments if you guys have any science youtubers that you really like jade to work with yeah who should i collaborate with i'll reach out to them yeah and you can reach out to them too on twitter or something if you uh if you feel feel so inclined that's a good idea Mm. do you ever think this is out of the blue but do you ever think time travel will be possible so so as i told you i'm um unrealistically or like overly optimistic um, so I tend to believe that anything that humans can imagine, we can achieve. Wow. Mm-hmm. And usually it doesn't look like the way that we think about it. Like a hive mind, like being able to read each other's minds, for example. Um, you know, with smartphones, like we're all so connected. And if I, it kind of looks like in the future, they're going to be in our brain. Like, you know, yeah. with like Neuralink and yeah. if not Neuralink, something else very similar. Um, and to me, that's kind of like having a hive mind. And yeah, maybe it's not what's directly out of the science fiction book, but effectively, like if someone from the past were transported here, 
they kind of think our smartphones and like if we're all connected mentally sending messages that that's like telepathic right um so i think that it's possible because i just think that human human beings have this like undeniable will mm. you know i forget the the fairy tale it's not coming to me right now but uh, uh sleeping sleeping beauty i think it's mirror mirror on the wall who's the fairest one of all and she has this magic mirror and she can use it to go and see people in other places and it's like oh that's that's a phone nowadays like yeah, we all have a magic true. mirror in our pocket and we can just go and look at people <laughs> it's true and like we don't even think twice about it you know yeah absolutely i mean it's i think she can only see maybe the fairest in the land or something and we have <laughs> a global range like <laughs> yeah this is better than that the what is it, snow white yeah it? one of them yeah this is even better than snow white's stupid mirror <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we don't even think twice, though. You're right. Are you, how soon are you going to get the, the, the chip in the brain, the, in the implant? What do you think? Uh, well, definitely, you know, I don't want to be one of the first. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. I don't know enough about it, I think. Like, I'm mm -hmm. not quite sure exactly what it does. Like, is it just like having a phone in your head or does it actually make you think better? Because obviously I want to think better. Like, mm -hmm. think faster, have better memory. Um, it will just increase your capacity, you know. Um, so, yeah, I would definitely get one as soon as they were, like, safe and, like, tested. Yeah. yeah. Would you? I don't know. It's tough. I mean, I would be isolated from the rest of the entire world if I didn't. I might go live with the Amish. <laughs> they're, they're not going to get it. Maybe they'll, <laughs> maybe they'll the place. Um, it's a tough one. I... I don't know if it'll be as good as they say. I don't I don't think I'm quite as optimistic as you because we still have this hardware, this brain hardware in place. And like, if you take it, I, I wonder if it'll be more similar to taking a drug. Like maybe it'll stimulate electrical currents that release a type of dopamine. dopamine. And then maybe it'll just kind of be like, just taking like a, like ADHD medication or something. I'm not, I'm not really sure. I mean, because... If ADHD medication didn't have downsides, I think yeah. I'd take it. Yeah, I don't think it's gonna have no downside. I don't know. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not sure. It's I mean, it's hard to have an upside without a downside for sure. Yeah, I, not maybe impossible. It'll, that's true. Maybe it'll help with memory though. Mm -hmm. Like if it if it gives you a reward stimulus every time you remember something, or like a strong emotional stimulus when you're studying, for instance, it might help consolidate memory really well. So, um, yeah, it'll probably do something very useful for us. I have one more question and it's from my my only patreon supporter uh which is my father and uh he asked the question of do you think we are living in a simulation um i was gonna say no because i i am a pretty strong believer in oakham's razor and i'm just like i don't really have a reason to think that we live in a simulation um, but also, but I don't think that's entirely true because I think living in a simulation would actually be a simpler explanation than like the explanation of the Big Bang and evolution of life. Like it's pretty random. Like <laughs> it's not like life is just this straightforward process um, or else it would just be everywhere kind of thing. Like it's, the chances are just very small. There are just a lot of things you have to explain. I don't feel like it's something you could just work out. Like, I feel like if uh, some kind of like, well, I mean, it would have to be life, but if something else discovered us, they wouldn't just be able to logic backwards and be like, oh, that's how they came into being. Do you know, I feel like there are a lot of just weird factors. Um, so like, I don't believe, I guess, uh, like with, I guess with my body, like that we're yeah. living in a simulation. I never think about it. I'm just like, everything seems pretty real to me. Um, but definitely we could be, you know, it's not a crazy thing to think. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. Kind of undecided. Thanks. And uh, maybe one more question. Uh, if you, do you have any advice for young up and coming scientists or science enthusiasts out there? Science enthusiast. Um... I would just say it's very normal to feel stupid. <laughs> I would just say it's like a, if you're feeling stupid, it's like a good thing because it means you're challenging yourself and like progressing and uh, like 
kind of all sciences, but mainly like physics and math, are very not counterintuitive, even if you know the lectures or whatever even if it's it comes very easily to some people and if you've been doing it for years I feel like your brain just kind of thinks that way like I definitely think more mathematically and scientifically now than I did um even five years ago um but yeah I would just say like if you find the ideas interesting and you're willing to work at it then I would say go for it and try not to get too discouraged great all right, um, I will let you go. So thank you so much, Dave, for coming on. It's it's been an Thanks absolute pleasure Thanks for having me, Serene. Yeah. By the way, um, Serene, as she mentioned, she runs her own YouTube channel where she interviews um, famous academics and uh, like authors and stuff, right? All sorts of people, uh, academics, authors. I've interviewed a coach and... Um, yeah, just really, it's anyone who I find engaging. If I if I if I watch their stuff and I just want to ask them a million questions, I go and find them. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's Serene Desiree on YouTube. So uh, make sure you subscribe to that. I'm, I'll put a link um, in the description and also in the card. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for the chat. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.